kept 10 minutes for us to enjoy and relish our film Disney and Pacha. So please take this opportunity to introduce yourself to uh, the partner sitting next to you and uh, of course get to know each other and make use of this 10 minutes to warm up or yeah, break the ice in the session. Please. I hope you all have gotten the chance to introduce yourself to your partners and get to mingle with each other. I would like to request the session back in order.
you know, making, taking the steps to make that real. Um, so you are, we are all, we could say, pioneers in trying to hold the list of organizations for this particular uh, association. And um, so with that, what I thought I would do today is to really, you know, give you a very broad outline of Tibetan history. Um, because, you know, we, while we are all living in exile as you know, Tibetans and diaspora, and we have central Tibetan administration in India, which is our mothership, if you want. And, you know, wherever we are, especially where we have large numbers of Tibetans together, you know, it's very important for the younger generation, as generations change, to be able to make emotional connections to who we are, the idea of who we are as Tibetans. And a core part of that, you know, in addition to our faces and our blood and our noses and eyes showing who we are, which is kind of stands out, but there is also there needs to be a, some attachment to the idea of what Tibet is and what Tibet was and what it means to be Tibetan. Okay, so to begin with, where did the word Tibet come from? Do we know what it means? Okay? And in Tibet we use the word Tibet, right? Tibet. Okay, so then, you know, when you start as younger generation Tibetans, you need to be, you should not take for granted that things are okay. Okay, and also, particularly, compared to your own parents' generation, the younger generations have less and less opportunity to fully immerse the Tibetan cultural life, because our majority culture is not Tibetan culture. So which means the responsibility falls on each of your children to really educate yourself, you know, by reading, by studying, by communicating, by talking to others, to really explore what it means to be a Tibetan. And what is Tibet? What is the idea of Tibet? So, for example, the Kintu Chappell says that, uh, you know, Tibet is probably a degeneration of the Tibetan term Tu. Tu is upper, the western part, or higher, so th because Tibetan plateau is high plateau, and Tu is a kind of a, um, you know, arbitrary term, like, you know, a lot of, lot of words don't have any particular meaning, so they have to take that. And he argumented that Tu, Tibet, is probably a degeneration of the word Tu which is the original name for Tibet. And you can he sort of expand a bit. And then what does her mean? And he gives two options. One is that it could be just an arbitrary term, which really has, you know, why would we call this Gawa? Because Gawa has no meaning, okay? Gawa is a word that we choose by convention to call something that's supposed to be. Okay, so Gawa is a, yeah, it's an arbitrary term. So her, he says, could be an arbitrary term. Or her would be a sort of a degeneration of the term term, like the term of term, which is the original Tibetan religion. So people who are proponents or subscribe to believers of that particular religion would be called term or term. So that's one thing to check out. But modern scholars are showing that in fact Tibet may be, the English word Tibet may be a degeneration of a Turkic Central Asian term, you know, which has some connotations to some high plateau area. So, so there it's, it's, it's complicated because sometimes we take for granted that Tibet is an English name that is used to refer to the, you know, to our country. Now, on the world stage, you know, Tibet first came into. Um, um, the, Okay, so on the world stage, we all know Chugya Mevanamsum, okay, well, every Tibetan should know Chugya Mevanamsum, the three ancestor religious kings of Tibet, Ongzen Babo, Tison Dezen, and Tirevajen. So on the world stage, Tibet really came into the picture in the 7th century with Songzen Babo. And Songzen Babo, you know, every single Tibetan should know who Songzen Babo was and what he did. Okay? During Songzen Babo's time, you know, the current writing system of Tibetan language was invented by Timisa Borat. Okay? 
He also uh, expanded the Tibetan boundaries, and Tibet in the past did not have direct border with China, because there was another kingdom called Asha. So to cut a long story short, Songzhen Gampo expanded the Tibetan border all the way to China and expanded this Tibet, and the Tibetan Empire really began during his time. And he reigned for quite a long time. The other thing that Song Zhenghe did was to really uh, first introduce systematic laws and regulations. So in Tibetan we call them shelche. So many shelches were invented. And in Tibetan textbooks we talk about yeah, So this is the 16 kind of cultural values that were established by Song Zhenghe. Another thing that he did was he also developed a standard of systems of measurement. Because in Tibet you have to barter, you know, you have to, at that time there was no you know, currency, so you barter. And when you barter, you need to have a system, you know, measurement system. And he was the one who standardized measurement systems. And, and then also, Songzhen Gambo was the one who first introduced Buddhism to Tibet. And initially, Buddhism to Tibet probably came not so much that Song Zagabu himself was a very devout Buddhist, but through imperial expansions to Central Asia, the areas that the Tibetan army invaded were all Buddhist. So the influence really came to Tibet through that way. And then, of course, Song Zagabu married a princess Wencheng, the Chinese princess, which was all from a Buddhist country, and then a Nepalese princess, a Kuti, both of whom were Buddhist. And Song Zagabu also built um, the famous, okay, this thing is not working. Tip, press number. Okay, so can you, yeah, so, so these are, okay, next, 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 okay. So these are the major achievements of Song San Gampo, which really, because once, it's not enough simply to have a military power. Tibet had a great military power. But to match the military might of the country, of the empire, you also need to have a sophisticated you know, culture. And so this is what Song Zhen Gampo really created. So, so the classical Tibetan initial kind of, you know, imperial period really began with him. Chik So this is the Chokhan Temple. This is the earliest temple built in Tibet. And this probably was finished around 641. The reason why we know that is because at that time, the Nepalese, there was a political problem in Nepal, and one of the Nepalese kings had to flee to Tibet. He sought asylum, and he came with a lot of artisans, and so he was there until 19, uh, 641. So we know that the Chogan was built before 641. Um, so this is a very, very early. Now, Next important king, so that among the Chujia Mevenam Song, is Tisun Dezen. So you can see there's about almost 100 years between Song Zhe Gampo and Song Dezen. So during this period, the Tibetan Empire kept building up. The one who really expanded further was Tisun Dezen. And Tisun Dezen actually Chik Man Nem Da. Okay. Next. So, Tizong Dezen actually expanded the Tibetan presence in Central Asia. So you have to remember, in those days, there were a couple of empires competing for power. So you have the Chinese Empire, Tibetan Empire, and then you have Turkic powers in Central Asia, and then the Arab and the Persian power. So if you look at the old Tibetan text, you know, Tibetans will talk about Kesar um, Mahidyo. It probably refers to Caesar. I don't think it's the Kesar that we know. Uh, there was some understanding of the European ancient history where Julius Caesar was a great warrior. So Kesar Mahidyo, Taksin Norgidyo. So this is Taji, but it's a Tasik is a word for Persian Empire at the time. So Persia was considered to be a very rich empire. So the Tibetans knew they had interacted with Persia 
Das ist noch gegeben. Ja, hat schön gegeben. So, India ist recognized as a place of Dharma and religion. And China, too, again. China was known as a place of great classics. Because if you look at the ancient Chinese history, they had a very sophisticated training for administration officials. So part of that included studying great classics, Tugai's classics. So you can, by simply looking at that list, you can see that Tibetan Empire at the time was not a very insular, inward-looking you know, country. It was actually quite expansive. It had understanding and awareness of the great powers around them, and also knew what was the unique feature of some of these great empires. So there is a, the younger, the, some of you are more interested, there is a really very important book called Tibetan Empire in Central Asia. This was published in the 80s. I think that is a very impressively researched book that looked at Chinese Tang Chronicles, Tang Annals and Arab sources that are references to Tibet, as well as ancient Tibetan texts from Tonghuang. So in the 8th century, the Tibetan imperial power was so great that actually in 763, Tibetan army seized the Chinese capital, imperial capital. The Chinese emperor had to flee, and Tibetans installed a puppet new empire. So, I mean, it was that powerful, much better. And then there was a peace treaty that was written after that. Um, in 786, Tibetan army reached the north edge of the Great Wall itself. So, I don't know if some of you may have heard about His Holiness when he visited Beijing in 1956, I think 55, I think 55, 56. Um, he was, you know, taken on a tour to the Great Wall of China, and one of the Chinese officials told His Holiness that in the past when Tibet was very powerful, the Tibetan army came right up to here. So he was referring to this, 786. And then Donghang, which is now more in the kind of a um, uh, certain part of China in modern, but Donghang area came under the Tibetan dominion and remained under the Tibetan dominion for nearly 100 years. And this is the reason why in the Donghang caves there are many texts that are written in Tibetan. So, and then Many parts of Central Asia, especially Khotan, which is really Tibetan, came under the Tibetan rule. So you can see, you know, the Tibetan Empire began in the 7th century, and it kept growing. So these are really important things that our younger generation need to know, that this, you know, our history, you know, goes quite far. Now, one of the major constructions during the Chisongdevin's time is Sanya Monastery. This is, in fact, the first monastery that was built. Um, and Chisongdevin himself was a scholar. He even wrote a text which is in Tengu. Uh, in the Sanya Monastery, he established like a university of different departments. There was a translation department, there was a d department for uh, Ngapas, you know, the non-monastic tantrics. There was a department for uh, the Panditas, so there were different departments in, in some years. So there was already, because it was modeled on Indian un monastic universities like Nalanda and Otantakuri. So, and it was during uh, Tisong Dezen's time that the Buddhism really became very well established. The first monks were ordained, and Shankarakshita, who was a great philosopher from Nalanda, was invited. Uh, systematic translations of Tibetan, uh, the Sanskrit Buddhist text began, Kandu and Tengu texts. Uh, actual compilation was much later, but the translations, systematic translations began around that time. So then the Tibetan Empire started its demise. So the last two kings were Tirebajin and 
I don't know, we'll do it again. The next one is, the second one is referred to as Lang Karma, which is a sort of a pejorative um, term to this game. And, you know, one of the things that you have to remember when reading traditional Tibetan history is there's the English saying, history is written by the winners. So as Buddhism became very influential in the Tibetan culture and most of the educated people became Buddhist monks, then the history started to reflect very deeply the Buddhist side. And then, of course, Wudum Zen was in fact the elder brother of Tirevajan. And he used Tirevajan, assassinated him. And Lang Karma started to rein in some of the excesses of Tirevajan, which involved you know, financially supporting many of the monasteries and monks, so which meant that the imperial treasure Treasury was getting depleted, and you know that the country itself was becoming economically weaker. So part of the measures that the king took was to really sort of you know un um, stop supporting the monastic institutions, you know stop supporting the translation projects. So which of course later got probably elaborated and exaggerated as a kind of a systematic persecution of the Buddhists. Um, our own history shows, suggests that he did a systematic persecution of the Buddhists, but modern scholars now dispute it. Um, they probably think it was more for economic and practical reasons that he started putting pressures. So like in the country, when the economy is going down, you have to cut down, you, know? <laughs> you have to downsize. So it was totally initially began in that way. Uh, but in any case, in 842, he was assassinated, so some of you may know about this Halun Pede Doji, and the, today the Shanak Cham is supposed to reflect that. So the, you know, the, the Lama dance, which has the long sleeves, it is supposed to be places where you hide the arrow and the bow, and as the king was reading the, the, the stone pillar, um, he was shot with an arrow and killed. But then in 42, when after the Lang Karma's assassination, then the succession became very complicated between competing families of different children. And over time, Tibetan began, empire begins to collapse. So by end of 9th century, the central rule of Tibet as an imperial period has really come to an end. Now, here, one person who has really brought attention to Tibetan to imperial period within the Tibetan literature is really Gindun Chita. Gindun Chita, I hope everybody knows who Gindun Chita is, yeah? Younger generation. You all know who Gindun Chita is, yeah? You don't know? Gindun Chita uh, is early 20th century. He died in 1953, 50, around 52, 53. Um, he was uh, um, he is considered by modern scholars as the great Tibetan modernist. modernist. And he uh, was a young monk from Hangzhou, studied at Drepu, and then um, met with an Indian scholar who was searching for the Sanskrit text in Tibet, and then went as interpreter and assistant to this Indian scholar, and then traveled to India. He spent 12 years traveling India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, and wrote a very, very important text called, you know, his journal, travel journal, which Don Rogers and I translated. Gindun Chappelle, the reason why Gindun Chappelle is very important for the Tibetan is that he was the first real modernist voice writing in Tibetan. He started to question many of the assumptions of traditional Tibetan perspectives on history, and also the place of Buddhism within the culture, Tibet's relationship with its neighbor, and Tibet's insularity that has become part of the habit, because Tibet didn't want to do anything with the outside neighbors, <coughs> and a shrinking knowledge of the neighbor countries. All of this, he really uh, didn't to be brought out. He also brought a real modern approach to understanding the history of Tibet using modern methods. Because modern historical methods 
don't emphasize the importance of traditional sources, but rather archaeological evidence becomes very important. And then whatever happens to the contemporary sources take greater precedence. And then compared to actual historical text, you take more, give more credence to the actual you know, texts such as letters that are written, communications, and so on. So this is a modern historical method of analysis which Kenton Chippel brought to Tibetan history. He then wrote The Unfinished White Annals, which is the first modern style history of Tibet, written in Tibet. Okay? So the younger generation of Tibetans, if you don't know Kenton Chippel, there's a huge hole in your understanding and knowledge of Tibetan culture and history. Okay? In Tibet, Kenton Chippel is celebrated. There are galleries named after him, there are you know, halls named after him, there are buildings named after him, there are museums named after him. He's really seen as the greatest modern Tibetan. Okay, so he, so Dilton Chabel, there are a few passages that I'll read from Dilton Chabel, okay? Uh, Dilton Chabel was the first Tibetan to really come across the Thoman historical material. And when he read these Thoman materials, he was very fascinated and he says that, uh, he says that looking at these Thoman materials, he says that, you know, the records were kept of the Tibetan emperors at the time, of what month, what date, where they were. It turns out, during the Gapu's time, in a large part of Nepal was under Tibet. So the king was moving to Nepal during winter when it was too cold. So he, then he talks about uh, how in the 7th century the Tibetan army even went up to India and occupied, invaded the Kanyan Kucha, which is the central Tibet, uh, Indian Empire at the time. And Sonsangapa was contemporary of Harsha Vardhana, one of the greatest Indian you know, emperors. Harsha was a sympathizer and supporter of Buddhism. The Chinese Xuanzang traveler who went to India was very well looked after by Harsha. And when he returned, the Tang emperor sent a delegation to thank Harsha. But by that time, Harsha was dead and Harsha's kingdom has been usurped by one of his ministers and who had, who mistreated the, the Chinese delegation and seized all the you know, offerings. And then the Chinese delegation reported back to Tang and the Tang emperor is just south, too far away from India and because Song Zengabo was married to a Chinese princess, he begged Song Zengabo to bring justice take a revenge, so Sultan Gambo sent down a military expedition all the way down from Tibet, crossed the Ganges, you know, invaded India, and it occupied the, the capital, Kanyakuja, and, you know, arrested that king and brought him back. So you can see that, that the sort of the power of Tibet at the time. So can you is talking about that? So I read this in Tibet, uh, he says that then, then he's lamenting the fact that most of the Tibetan history was written by Buddhist monks and they overemphasized the religious dimension and they underplay the importance of Tibetan imperial achievements. And he says that so he's really saying that all of these things that I refer to, unfortunately, in traditional Tibetan history, they were forgotten because they don't have much to do with Buddhism. 
So he's pointing out that history, when you write history, you really need to write both about Buddhism and culture, but also about its military and empire and its fall. So the point I'm trying to make is that when we think of Tibet, okay, we need to think all the way back to the 6th century. And particularly the younger generation of Tibetans, you know, as long as our struggle remains, you know, we need to have a sophisticated understanding of our own history and what it means to be Tibetan. And also a conflicting narratives that would come from different sources. So if, if we are not secure in our own narrative, then we don't have the confidence to really respond to another conflicting narrative. And this, I think, is a very important point I'm trying to make. But the details of the history can be read elsewhere. But what is important is to really have an appreciation because during the imperial period, Tibet was as powerful as the competing empires at the time, the Chinese Empire, the Persian Empire, the Arabs, and the Turks, okay? Now, of course, after the fall of the uh, imperial Tibet, then Tibet went through what is called her Silpum. It's when the, the central authority was dismantled. Tibet became ruled by small kingdoms and different regions, like in, in the rest of Tibet, there was the Kogi Kingdom, Hungary, there were many different kingdoms. And then in the Yuan period, which is in the 13th century, the, the, as the Mongol invasion of mainland China took place, then Khoden Khan army came to Tibet. And in the 13th century, then the, 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 the Mongolians, they became devotees of the Sakya Pandita. And through that way, the Sakya rule came to Tibet. You know, the Sakya's rule. And after that, there were a couple of different rules. But then, so those are complicated, you know. So the Sakya rule from 1270 to 1354. Next comes Pagdu rule. And the, in the Pagdu rule, the one who founded the Pagdu rule is Taisi Chang Gyalsi. He was actually quite an impressive uh, ruler. And because the Yuan Sakya rule was you know, supported by the Yuan, there were a lot of Mongolian influence in Tibet. And what Pakdu founder did was to really bring back the old imperial systems of dress. So today, many of the Tibetan aristocratic dress that we see really began more from the Pakdu period. Because Pakdu was really wanted to bring back the imperial Tibetan habit. And this, it was during this period that Tsongkhapa was active. Uh, then very briefly, Rinpong took over, and there was a brief period of Tsangpa, and then the Dalai Lama's rule began in the 17th century until 1959. So that's a broad brush in history. Now, from a historical kind of point of view, particularly thinking about our struggle, the, the, there are few important points in history that we really need to understand a bit more in order to fully appreciate our narrative. One is the Yuan period during the Sakya rule. Sometimes the, you know, the counter-narrative makes the case because Sakya was were ruling on behalf of the Yuan Emperor, which was then ruling China, that Tibet became part of China. So that's a, one argument that is clear. And Tibetans need to understand what are the basis for that particular line of thinking and argument. Okay? Here, after the Sakya rule, there was hardly any influence from China in Tibet. Then, during the Seven Dalai Lama period, there was a two Gorkha invasions in Tibet from Nepal um, in the 18th century. And during the second Gorkha invasion, Tibetans were not able to repel the Gorkhas, then sought the help of the Qing Emperor. And at that time, the Qing Emperor were Tibetan Buddhists. They were all followers of the Giluk teachings. And through close connection between the Giluk Lamas, particularly the Panchen Lama and the Qing Emperor, the Qing soldiers came to Tibet 
And in fact, the, the, the head of the Qing army was not a Han Chinese. It was deliberate. The Qing were Manchus. They were not Han. They were Manchus. So then, after repelling the Orcas, the Qing established a presence in Tibet through some proxy system. Okay? So again, so that is another period that is sometimes used as a counter-narrative to show that Tibet was in fact ruled by the Chinese. Now, those are complicated arguments. I think the Tibetan, particularly the educated ones, it is our responsibility to read about this, to know, and as much as possible to be objective. You cannot say there was never any influence in Tibet by the Chinese. Of course there were. The Yuans were there, the influence was there, Qings were there. But one thing that is we have to understand, and here modern scholarship is helpful. There was one, there is one historian at Columbia, Greg Tabo, his book, Makings of Modern uh, Tibetan Lamas and the Making of Modern Tibet. He made a very important point. He said that even when Qing Empire emperors had some authority in Tibet, they never considered Tibet, they never considered Tibet as part of China. They consider Tibet as part of Qing Empire. But that's a very different kind of argument. Because during the Qing period, part of Korea was also under the Qing Empire. Okay? Qing also absorbed part of Nepal as part of its empire. So it's a different kind of argument. Okay? So these are, you know, I think for us Tibetans, especially the educated ones, okay, those who can read English, there are so many modern studies that that really shed light on this. And we need to show that the, the sensitive periods are really, the imperial period is not an issue. Because sometimes in the old days, argument was made that because Kong, when Shin Kongjo married a princess, a Chinese, a Tibetan emperor, therefore Tibet became part of China. That is ridiculous. So that argument is no longer brought up. Now the arguments are really the Yuan period and then the Qing period. And those two periods, we need to know, because the Tibetans' own history is sometimes not that clear. And you need, and part of the history re you know, requires comparison of different sources, not just Tibetan sources, but the Chinese sources, and other sources like the Arab sources, and so on. So that, I just wanted to share with you, because you, you're going to get a lot of other speakers' future, but I thought I would give you this broad outline of history at first, so that we have a sense of who we are as Tibetans, okay? Now, from, you know, these days it's not fashionable to make arguments from the ethnicity, but from an ethnicity point of view, the fact that Tibetans are very different from our brother and sister Chinese is demonstrated by a recent study that came out quite a while ago, actually, maybe about 10 years ago, it was a genetic study that showed that the Tibetans are one of the very few races that have acquired a certain mutation that adapts us at this high altitude. Even the people in the Andes do not have it. So these are, you know, and genetic mutations take a long period of time. So that suggests that we are actually, even racially, very different. Now, as to the history, the future of what kind of political structure Tibet should have is a different question. And here, with his ordinances, wise leadership, Tibetans have basically sort of, you know, agreed to find a middle way solution where we can retain our, protect our identity within the larger People's Republic of China. And I think the distinction should be made between China and PRC. People's Republic of China is a modern nation began only at the beginning of the 20th century. China is an ancient nation. And another distinction that we need to make is between nation and country. You know, according to the middle way policy, there will be only one country, but Tibet, we should be a nation. And distinction between nation and country is a difficult concept in Tibetan because we don't have two different worlds. But in English, we do. If you look at Great Britain, Scotland and uh, uh, Wales are nations. They are not countries, they are nations. Because they are nations, 
at the Olympics level, they are represented separately. So that doesn't undermine the integrity of Great Britain. So we need these kind of sophisticated thinking in the way in which we think about who we are. And we should not, we should never give up our nationhood. You know, I think the nation, that the notion of a nation, and here we can learn a little bit from the, the resilience of the sense of nationhood by the Native Americans. You know, they have an idea of a nation. So I think that this distinction between nation and country, and I think these, these kind of things with Tibetans, we really need to know. So racially, we are different. And linguistically, Tibetan language is very different from Chinese. In the Tibetan language, although we use the, the writing system that is based on the Indian system, but the language itself is very different from the Indian language. The Tibetan language is very different from the Indian language. The closest language we have is, is Burmese. Burmese is the only close language that we have in the language family. And there is hardly any linguistically connection between Tibetan language and Chinese language. So linguistically, you know, we are very different. And because we must have a different nation, because language evolved over thousands and thousands of years. Written language may be new, the spoken language are thousands of years old. And spoken language, Tibetan, the fact that it is so different suggests that we were a completely different people for a long time, occupying that huge plateau in Tibet. So we need to have, if we are serious about our identity of who we are as Tibetans. We need to have an emotional attachment to the land. You know, Tibet, you know, this, in the old text talks about high peaks, snowy peaks, mountain, azure blue skies, pure water, sato, namo, and kamri So those are really what makes Tibet very unique. Those who have been to Tibet know that the depth of color of the sky really takes you away, not takes your mind away. So I think we need to, even though we may not be able to visit to that, some of us, but we need to have an emotional attachment. You know, if you look at the history of the Jewish people, for 2,000 years, they kept their attachment to the idea of a nation. Through generations, just for 2,000 years. Okay? So we, we need to, you know, find a way to communicate that kind of attachment to every Tibetan. And attach, you know, Buddhism is a very important part of our heritage. But Buddhism alone is not enough for us to continue our identity. Buddhism is a universal religion. You know, we have a different, unique version of Buddhism. But what will make our identity strong is a combination of strong attachment to the land, some understanding of uniqueness of who we are as people, and some appreciation of this broad history that has really made us an ancient nation. And if you look at many of the nations in the world, the fact that we have a written language system as early as 7th century, that is pretty impressive. We even had a grammar. Okay, so you went down to work. Grammar written in the seventh century for our own language. And if you think about English, modern English grammar is only the 16th century. Until that time, the grammars were all about Latin grammar. Okay, so these are the things that we need to understand. And the main point I'm trying to make here is, you know, all of you are going to high school, you are going to university, so you have no excuse to say, I don't understand this. Okay? Now, if I spoke in classical Tibetan, you can say, oh, it's, it's okay, talk to you, you know, I don't understand this, you know, then you can leave it. <laughs> but the fact that I'm saying it in Tibetan, saying it in English, you have no excuse, and you have all the resources, especially these days with, with the click of a button, you know, with the Wikipedia, with the Googles, and, you know, there are just so much resources if you don't do the work, then it is your own fault, okay? So the main point I'm trying to make is that it is not enough simply to say free Tibet, free Tibet, and say that we're different from Chinese. We need to have some content to the idea of Tibetan-ness. 
And that content cannot be defined only in Buddhist terms. Okay? Buddhism is very important part of our heritage, but it needs to have some nationalism element in it. And that I think is very important. And I hope that in the discussion that you're going to have after the question and answer, I hope you will take up some of these points. You know, issues of identity. Okay? You know, how how does Buddhism play into that defining role of identity? And what do you think is important things that we as diaspora Tibetans need to know and communicate? And in the end, you know, even though there will be so many day-to-day meetings, India, the said city, and all the rest, in the end, our struggle, the nature of our struggle, is quite a simple one. It's a struggle for maintaining our narrative. That really is our struggle. You know, making sure that our narrative is clear, truthful, and compelling. Because in the end, the, the international sort of, you know, activity that we do is really, in the end, it's a sort of a, international, a public relations campaign on an international stage. That's what it is. And a public relations campaign on an international stage ultimately won by who has the most compelling narrative. It's not a question of might. And the compelling narrative will come from people who are telling the story, who are compelling, who have confidence, and who, are, who have relevant, read their sources, and who know who they are. Okay? So I think Tibetans sometimes, you know, Tibetans have this easy going attitude, and then especially those who grew up in India, we have this chalega chalega, and we get complacent. You know, if we, you know, we never strive for excellence. We really need to try to strive for excellence. And sophistication is what we need. Curiosity, sophistication, so that any Tibetan, educated Tibetan, when they find a, an opportunity to tell the story to them, they can tell it with sophistication, with powerful narrative, with conviction. And in order to do that, you got to do the hard work. There's no easy way out, okay? So I wanted to share this with you. And then, of course, part of this is really going to be your mastery of the language. And I know this is where we have one weakness. Because uh, the spoken language and the written language is quite far. So we, many of us, can speak to that, but when it comes to writing, and I hope over time, the Tibetan writing language will get modernized. I, in fact, wrote a modern grammar, um, which some are taking seriously, some are criticizing it, but I think we need to find a way to eventually bridge the gap between the spoken Tibetan and the written Tibetan so that the acquisition of writing will become easier. But this is a bigger struggle that the, that the, the elder generation needs to take seriously, but in the meantime, I think all of you should also make sure that you are conversant in Tibetan, at least the colloquial Tibetan. The reading and writing is a tougher one, especially the writing, because the, the writing system is still, is still very classical. But the spoken Tibetan, because you know most of you have parents of both Tibetan, and you interact with Tibetan, so the language, and also really continue to follow the, the classes here. And those who are university students, I know it's expensive, but the UVA, University of Virginia, has the best intensive two-month course. And it's worth every penny. So it's, uh, that's what my younger daughter did this summer. It's really, they, they teach Tibetan in the way in which you are supposed to teach Tibetan as a second language, as a foreign language. So the teachers who, the university, UVA is generally known for summer language uh, intensives. But their Tibetan summer language intensive is a really good one. So those who can afford, if you take that two month, you know, summer language course, it will not only spoken but also written Tibetan will improve, you know, immediately. So those are things that I just wanted to share with you. And uh, I'll stop here. Sorry, I was supposed to speak only for 45 minutes, but I got excited. <laughs> so we'll take the we'll stop here and take some question and answer. What? Yeah. I'm very, very grateful for uh, Geshe and Dora Jimbala's uh, extremely insightful lecture presentation.
presentation on given identity and history. With this, we would like to move on uh, with our question and answer session. Given the time constraint, uh, we would not be able to entertain more than four or five questions. And I would also like to request the participants to keep their questions as brief as they could. And if, if, you, if they could make it to the point question, please. Uh, anyone would like to put a question, please? We're open for questions from our participants. Don't be shy. Please okay? don't be shy. So this is one this of is the this is one of the downsides of the We are sometimes not as certain enough. Okay, so and in Tibetan we call it Tom Sel. We need Tom Sel, we need a certain. This is our opportunity. Uh, just there. Uh, this is, uh, I had a question regarding so I believe it was both about. So uh, I was born in Nepal, uh, my parents were born in Tibet, and I came here in 2005, I in grade seven. So in terms of identity, I often uh, ask myself uh, identity to sort of define my experiences, because the importance of Nepal being independent, but also having the sort of influence of the Nepali culture, the Hindi culture, the Bollywood culture, coming here, it was a lot easier to sort of immerse myself in the Tibetan culture in Nepal. But being here, trying to adapt to the Western culture, I think there's also a challenge to maintain that uh, experience and identity. And how would, so I often ask myself, how can I maintain and pursue the same type of uh, experience that's sort of expected in Nepal, but over here? So thank you. That's a really uh, good question because, um, you know, the very nature of uh, diaspora life is you're going to be living in a cultural environment where the majority culture is going to be not that. So that's the very nature of it. So um, when we talk about Tibetan identity and culture, uh, particularly the culture, I don't think we should have a fixed notion of an unchanging culture. That because the culture is always evolve and always change, okay? And every interaction of another with another culture is going to change both. So those of us, for example, who grew up in India, I and mean, including myself, even though I was a monk for some time, when it comes to popular culture, my popular culture was Bollywood. So and and we shouldn't be embarrassed about it. You know, being a Tibetan, having the education and appreciation of Bollywood culture, we shouldn't be embarrassed about it. That's where we grew up. That is a part of the cultural menu in which we lived. Um, but on the other hand, when we talk about Tibetan culture and identity, then we need to have some sense of within this pluralistic society, again, we, who we are as Tibetan. And that probably includes, of course, some attachment to the idea of Tibet, some attachment to the notion of Tibetanness. Uh, some, you know, especially the majority of Tibetans are Buddhist, so something to do with the, you know, Buddhist values and heritage. So those things, and then the language. So I think we, we should not have a, a idea that there is only one way of being Tibetan. That, I think, is too dramatic. So for each individual, there may be different shades, you know, they, you know but there should, they should be a core path which has to be constant. That has to do with some attachment to this beautiful land, right now under someone else's control, and some history of that, and important points in the history. And if you are, you know, and, and particularly if you are religious, then also to have some emotional connection to some of the religious figures, like Tatna Sambhala or Chesokapa or some of these. And also an appreciation of the key values in your own everyday life. So those are, so it's, you know, the, to cut a long story short, we shouldn't have the idea that there's only one way of being to that. Thank you. Next question. You can ask any question. It doesn't have to be, it depends, you know, related to what I said, okay? Just, yes. Uh, 
pure sensation versus perception and interpretation. Um, this is part of the problem is really in the language, the word perception. Because in the Buddhist text, um, sensations are perceptions. So, um, so therefore they are referred to as pratyaksha, direct perceptions. So then we use the word direct, direct perceptions. And anything that involves interpretations, you know, because the, the, the differentiating between pure perception or sensation and thought has to do with any, any imposition of category. So you have a pure sensation of this object in front of me. The moment I say this is a mask, you have, you have categorized it. So it, any perceptual processes that involve the bringing in, you know, categories, you know, types, kind and attributes, then that becomes in the thought and the cognitive processes. So the kundos are concepts coming from the Abhidharma. So that's, that's another complication. And according to Abhidharma psychology, every cognitive process is supposed to have five kundos. So even the pure sensation will have some prototype of five kundos, which will involve, for example, like I may not recognize this as a table at the level of pure perception, pure sensation, but there will be edge detections. Okay? So there will be edge detections, and there will be pure sensation will pick up this versus this without imposing categories because there's an abound aboundedness to the object. And so those will be total kind of, you know, kundos. And even pure sensation is supposed to have a tone, so that's a key. Edge detection will be the discrimination. So kundos are, you, you have to sort of even understand that pure sensation level kundos as well. No, they can't get it. Because every cognitive process is thought to have some feeling tone with it. What is feeling tone? Well, because the thing is, for example, um, um, feeling tone is because when when an experience arises, it arises either with a uh, with a sort of a more negative effect or a positive effect or a neutral effect. So it's more the kind of underlying tone. No, no, we can have a separate conversation after, okay? <laughs> uh, we're left with only a um, little amount of time to entertain only one last question. So I think 
a distinction can be made. I mean, this is why I think the, the notion of Tibetan ness um, may not necessarily entail being a Buddhist. Because if we insist that, a being, that the, the idea of Tibetan ness necessarily entails the you know, idea of being a Buddhist, then we have a problem. So that's why I say that the Buddhism is an important part of the narrative. But Tibetan ness actually goes beyond that. And there needs to be you know, something that has to do with attachment to a particular land and history and ethnicity and you know, shared experience of that, you know, Tibetan, that, that people. So uh, for the Buddhists, of course, Buddhism is a very important part of that narrative. But for the non-Buddhists, and Tibet, for example, had presence of Islam in Lhasa for over 400 years. So it's not just a new thing that is happening now. It was there for a long time. And historically, there are temples, um, you know, in Tibet. You know, they don't see themselves as numbers. They call them Buddhists, but not, not um, they, don't, they don't call them Chubas. They don't call themselves Chubas. And so they have a different narrative when it comes to religion. But then the notion of Tibetanness would still be shared. So I think your, your point about finding the right balance between the Tibetan identity and the place of Buddhism is a crucial one. Because sometimes in our general narrative, we are too, um, what's the word, too simplistic. Yeah. And we conflate the two, and being Tibetan becomes being a good Buddhist. So uh, that sort of simplicity needs to be avoided. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about how, like, how mindful we should be in being too Buddhist centric. Although I know the majority of us are Buddhist. Thank you. Uh, we still have time to entertain one last question. So, anyone who has one more question? There's one, yeah. yeah. Jay, Jay, Jay. Oh uh, yeah, thank you very much for uh, giving us this insightful uh, speech. So my question is about specifically having a formal education. I think, based on personal experience, it's not really that valid, especially considering the amount of debt a lot of your students will go through. So my question to you is, uh, is it really something that you need to recommend a lot of young kids? Maybe they should wait for a more longer period of time before they actually invest in something that's close. So, I'm just wondering, is that something? I didn't catch what, what, what should be the comment? Uh, the importance of formal education. Like oh. You're saying that it's actually really important that we have to get go through something like that. And I will get to that for that. That's not really something that is uh, important. Formal education being what? Uh, like a university degree or something? Oh. Yeah. Um, that will give you 
and life experience, which probably you're not going to have in the future, because once you finish your university, you have the career, you have to go through the, you know, the, the process you know, of getting a job and all of this. So I think the university period, and first of all, the age is a very important you know, period. And then the experience that you will gain at that time will make a huge difference. So I think what you are going to ask me is not specific to Tibetan. Maybe to some extent, yes, because Tibetan community is still very traditional. In the traditional communities, parents tend to impose a lot of their will. So maybe in that system, it's relevant. But it is a general question, actually. Um, but I would still, even if someone is going to take a gap year, I would still highly recommend that they apply to university, get a place, then negotiate and take a year off. Not leave, postpone when you apply to university. Because then once you get to spend a year working, then you may actually lose the edge and start thinking, maybe I don't need to go to university. Uh, so that's also a balance. Thank you. Thank you. We will conclude our question and session round here. Thank you so much for all the participants for your questions. And thank you, Gisela, for your uh, answers. Um, after this, it's around 11.30. We are breaking out for our tea break, our tea session. Uh, we can digest our food of thought and enjoy a hot tea and some refreshment. Right after that, we have round tables on both of the sides of our hall. And uh, at... Um, 11.45, I would expect uh, all of us, all the participants uh, on the round tables, uh, all of you already have a chip by now which says a specific number and all the tables also have that number so you can go to the table, the number that you have. Uh, from number 1 to 6, we have all the tables on the left hand side and from number 7 to 10, we have all the tables on the right hand side. So at 11.45, we would all gather at our round table for small group discussion. And we've also already distributed the topics that we would like to discuss in our small group discussion. Thank you so much. Please enjoy your tea break.
to Morshi with your friends. And you do have your choices, or could you like, uh, do you have any classes, and, like, dance classes, music classes? Thank you so much, Anjan Kamala. That was group two from Yonkin Kamala. Moving on, we have group three, Tudobla. Tudobla, wherever you are, we will see you again. Thank you so much, Anjan We had the same question as group three, and we also had similar answers. So to preserve the language we had, kids must take the initiative to start speaking at home with their parents or siblings. And then to promote uh, Tibetan reading and writing, we have Tibetan reading and writing classes here. And then you can also listen to and watch Tibetan movies. And yeah, that's all we can do. Thank you so much, Tibetan. From Group 4, we have Tenzin Sonomla. Tenzin Sonomla, wherever you are, thank you. Uh, the question is how relevant or important Tibetan language is for the younger Tibetans. <coughs> we discussed about this and got a few points over here. It says uh, to keep our culture so it doesn't uh, disappear. So we're at this point right now, we're talking about how important it is for us. And if we don't keep this together right now, what are we going to pass on to the younger generation? And we have kids and stuff like that, you know? And then, um, so yeah. If we don't like take care of our own language and people ask us about Tibetan and stuff, if we can't talk much about it, then who else is going to care about this thing? That's how important it is to younger Tibetans. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Next we have Sonam Pongela from Group 5. <laughs> Sonam Pongela from Group 5. <laughs> Being a Tibetan, eating Tibetan food, uh, like Momo, Shabale, uh, <laughs> running on Tibetan time, so you might come two hours late to events. <laughs> uh, also, being a Tibetan is walking through gym set and paying attention to 30 different people. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> we have uh, Sonam uh, alias uh, Chingyan. Ching from group six. Right, so okay. Thank you. Uh, number one, of course, because it's our culture. If we don't keep it alive, we'll be forgotten. Uh, it's our heritage. Otherwise, it'll be whitewashed. Okay, number two. Uh, most Tibetan youth don't care enough. It's our own heritage. A mixture of both Western plus Tibetan culture benefits. Yeah. Okay, number three. Speak it at home. Uh, go to Tibetan language classes. Communicate in Tibetan with other friends. Immerse yourself in Tibetan media, news, film, music. Watch Dalai Lama features. Okay. Hello. Of um, in like there's a treasure in your basement, 
of your home and you don't, you're not even aware about it and you're just going outside trying to look for treasure in the jungle. Uh, trying to survive in the jungle but the treasure is in your basement. So all you have to do is to get your lazy ass down there and try to open that treasure and try to be aware of your surroundings. Basically connect with your grandparents, connect with your uh, history of your Tibet, stories that are told by your Tibet. There's always a meaning and value that you can carry. And, uh, Okay, that's enough. Thank you so much, Baha Tashina, for representing uh, your group and trying your best to come out of your comfort zone. Uh, next, we have Group 8, Pinto Omora. Yeah. 
learn in Tibetan in the West is a struggle. Um, for those whose parents are both Tibetans, you're fortunate. I hope your parents spoke Tibetan to you when you were a kid. Um, I do notice now that uh, there's a new trend, which is a little unfortunate, that even though both parents are Tibetans, I've seen often they speak their children in English, uh, which is a real tragedy, particularly when you're living in a cultural environment and society where the outside language is English, you don't have to worry about your children's acquisition of English because you know, entertainment is going to be in English, school language is going to be in English, you know, the peers are going to speak English. So it is not your job to teach your kid English. You know, teaching English is going to come. I mean, if you look at parents of mixed races, you know, you can see, in fact, you imagine you have a Tibetan father, a, you know, French, you know, English-speaking mother, and living in France. It's doable to have three languages. Father speaks in Tibetan, mother speaks in English, school speaks French. So, in a mono-language culture environment like Toronto, there's just no justification and excuse for parents for speaking English only to their kids. It's just simply no justification other than pure laziness. Okay, so I think this is something that is really important because I know parents worry about their children not being able to communicate. Once they start going to daycare, they will pick up English. The moment they open the TV, it's all in English. So I think that it's very important because the, this important theme came up. And it's it's a, sort of the first question and the third question are kind of very closely connected. The relevance of language for Tibetan youth and how to preserve language. They're very intimately connected. So all of you are going to be at some point parents. Please remember this. You know, in my case, I have two girls. We were living, we live in Montreal, which is a French speaking. So then they need to be English. So then a third language was a complicated one, having three languages. So now they are catching up. Sometimes they criticize me. They say, why didn't you teach me to that? Just not that easy, but, but now they are catching up. So I think it would be easier if the parents had spoken to them right from the beginning. And spoken language, if the children are very small, they will pick it up very easy. Because children have the capacity to pick up to four or five languages, especially two languages fluently. You know, there are a lot of studies that show that children who are bilingual actually have both languages as part of their mother tongue. The mother tongue is spoken from the left brain. Acquired second language is spoken from the right brain. <laughs> so, so in my case, you know, I didn't learn English much later. So when I get tired, then it's, you know, I struggle with words. So it, that shows that it is, even though I speak rather fluently, but it's not as fluent as a mother tongue. So whereas if you speak to children before age of four, they will they will acquire it as if it's a mother tongue. So I think language, we need to make a distinction between acquisition of written language and spoken language. Being able to teach children how to write, that is a challenge. This is a very difficult one in our case, because in English, how you write it is very close to how you say it. Very close. So if you learn to speak English well, you also learn to speak. You, you also learn to write well, quite easily. In Tibetan, it's more complicated. We have sango rangos and you know, which are silent, which does modify because na sang When you put the superscript, it becomes na. She modifies the sound, but there is no hint of s anywhere. We have munju. Munju still modifies. So if you look at the chant, ka 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 na, cha 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 na, ta 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 na, pa 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 na, and it's when you learn ka 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 na, it's important to not write all the way like this. It's important to write in columns because the first letters ka cha ta pa cha, they're all very high. They never get modified. 
they never get modified. The sound remains exactly the same. And the second column, ka, cha, ka, ka, cha, they never get modified. They remain exactly the same. It is the third column, ka, cha, ka, pa. That is different, but ka, cha, ka, pa, that gets modified. Ka becomes ga, you know, cha becomes ja, ta becomes da, and then pa becomes, with a wind it becomes wa, ta wa, and sambura becomes ba. So because ba is not represented in Tibetan, so we have to create it by constructing. And then the, when you put the ragas, again, it's not in the consonant, but we have to create that sound. So in order to create that sound, you put a semi-vowel. So ragas are semi-vowels, yatas are semi-vowels, and semi-vowels sound will be contained. So you say, payata cha. So the yata modifies the sound of pa, because it's a semi-vowel. So the Tibetan writing system is complicated, but there is a system, there is a trick in which you can learn it, so that you know how the sound is. So in any case, the point I'm trying to make is, the parent's responsibility is to really teach the spoken language. Written language has to be taught in some, you know, Sunday classes, and also, you know, it's easier to learn how to read, but it's quite difficult to learn how to write. Because the Tibetan you know, the grammar system is complicated, the Tibetan grammar is borrowed from Sanskrit and imposed on Tibetan, so that has a mis you know, mismatch. And then all the windows and sangurangos, you know, make a difference to the spelling. So, you know, hair cha is the same as tashi, sound is the same, same exactly the same. Tewo, you know, tewo, monkeys, they have exactly the same sound, but written differently. So this is part of the problem of Tibetan, and that is a problem that needs to be handled se separately. And hopefully, at some point, we will have some clever linguist among Tibetans who will map out, find a key to say, okay, all of these categories are spelled like this, all of these categories are spelled like this, so then the children will just have to memorize a set of words. I hope so, because the Chinese, this is how they do. Chinese children have to learn several thousand, you know, words, you know, characters by heart. And once they learn those thousands of characters by heart, they can write. So in Tibetan, at some point, and I just hope like Shiri Department, the Education Department in India, will actually set up a whole committee, do a research, make it easy, so that children at this age, you learn this many words by heart. You learn this many verbs by heart. You know, then we know by age this, you learn this many words. Age by that, you learn this many words. This is a work that needs to be done by scholars, committees, and parents can't do this. And it's unrealistic to expect parents to be able to teach children growing up in the West how to write to them. But the parents should be expected to teach how the Tibetans to speak to them. Because spoken Tibetan is easy like any other language. Okay, and also Tibetan grammar is quite simple. You know, if you learn it, the spoken one, you know, we don't modify the verb according to, you know, tenses, you know, I mean, they have the, the modification, but most of the, the verb changes remain pretty simple. The Tibetan language, spoken language itself is quite simple. The structure is simple. You have a subject, you have verb at the end, and everything in between. Yama, kasan, kyabala, I mean, like, it's basically, the sentence structure is pretty simple. Okay, it's not that complicated. So spoken Tibetan is easy to teach. So I think, um, and then uh, someone suggested, uh, you know, among the entertainment, to have more material for children. Um, I think that's again a very important one, but it's a challenge. You have you need to have resources. You know, financially it's not going to be viable. And many unfortunately many Tibetans don't pay. For example, like, you know, um, Pugut, what is his name? The singer Pugut, uh, 
Putin and Gel. Putin and Gel songs are very popular, but very few people actually buy the CD, you know, they just copy. <laughs> so entertainment, creating entertainment, again is it's a good idea unless you have some system like in CTA education department or something that would be funding these things. Again, it's a, it is a challenge. It's not really practical, and it, you can't expect you know individuals to be doing it day in and day out purely on a voluntary basis. But I think it's a good idea. One thing that those who are learning how to write um, that is really helpful, and particularly the classical development listen to his holiness is not just teaching his public talks Tibetan colors his colors many of them are now transcribed and his holiness speaks one of the most beautiful Tibetan and it's classical vocabulary but the sentence structure and the grammatical structure is fluid and so it's a much closer to the everyday spoken Tibetan but with a more sophisticated vocabulary and sentence structure. And if you can learn to read the transcripts of His Holiness's colors, I think you can, you know, when I was learning English at the monastery in South India, and I left school after grade four, so I had English only after grade four in India. And I was in South India. What I did, I would take a piece of one page of English text, and study it. Look at the structure. You know, learn new words, memorize them, look at dictionary. You know, I really studied it on my own. You know, I basically looked at a you know book or a magazine like Time magazine. I used to buy the you know old ones for two rupees on the streets in Mysore or Bangalore. And then I would look at an article and I'll spend day after day underlining all the sentences that I don't know looking at the sentence structure, looking at the vocabulary, building up my vocabulary. That's how I learn English. So if I can learn English like that, in a monastery, where in the culture environment nobody speaks English, why can't you guys learn written Tibetan in that way? You know, set aside two hours of a weekend, okay, find a couple of text, one page, underline words that you don't know, Look at a dictionary, ask someone, look at this two things, sentence structure and vocabulary. And sentence structures, you can impose the English grammar on this. What is the subject? What is the verb? And in Tibetan sentence structure, the first thing you have to catch is the main verb. Because in Tibetan, unfortunately, we don't have a full stop. That's one big weakness of the language and language. And in my modern book, I've suggested we should now introduce a full stop. You know, every person who's now writing in Tibetan should use a full stop. There is a particular sign called Rinjempung Shet, three dots and a stroke, which used, in the old days, it was used when we have an orphan syllable in a text like this. There are only six or seven lines. And when there's an orphan syllable here, it's called, then we put this particular symbol. But these days in a computer age, there's, you know, the, the lines are going to always get mushed up. So that, I suggested we use it as a full stop. So that's one of the big problems of written Tibetan. There is no full stop, so you don't know where to stop. Okay, so it goes on and on and on and on and on. Whereas if you look at English text, you see the first sentence, when you're reading it, you're not going to worry about what comes next. You're just going to stop where the full stop is, and you're going to figure out what that text means. So those things I think the Tibetans will have to learn and hopefully the community itself and the scholarly community will take this issue of modernization of writing systems seriously so that at least we have punctuations where there is a stop <laughs> so that it makes the reading easier for the younger generation of Tibetans. So I think, you know, we all agree language is important. We also agree on how best to promote this, I think speaking at home is really, really important. And also, um, someone brought up the role of um, Tibetan performance, Jogar, which I think is really good. Uh, I know that many uh, non-English speaking um, 
people learn English by listening to Beatles song. And you know, learning a language by you know uh, learning a song is a really good way. Uh, the Tibetan songs, um, the modern ones are easier, but the classical ones are again the terminology is very tough, you know, not ten thong in ten I mean who's gonna know what that means? <laughs> you know, it's, it's a very tough classical term, but the modern such songs are much easier. So I think Jogar I think is a really good one. And I would suggest also you should take a look at Hamu. You know, um, in my classic series, we edited one volume, it's a 32 volumes on Tibetan culture, uh, traditional knowledge. One volume is on Hamu, and the Hamu writing is actually quite different from normal writing, because Hamu in Tibet was not taken seriously by the scholars. Hamu was really more of a folk entertainment. So Hamu was really written, Hamu texts are written by lay people, and Hamu songs, many of them are in verses, are much closer to the spoken Tibetan. So the, the reason why I bring this up is that the English translation of that same volume is going to come early next year in our series. And in this English text, they have a page number reference to the Tibetan volume. The Tibetan volume is freely available on the download you know, on the website. And then you can look at the Tibetan Tamil text and the English text. And in that way, you will also learn. So, this is how you can learn the written Tibetan. And then, so for example, I translated the new trails, the Tan Pusetan, the grains of gold. Again, the good thing is to, uh, one thing you can have the English text here, have the Tibetan text here, and use your English to understand the Tibetan and read it, and study one page at a time, and that way you will increase your vocabulary, you will come to know the sentence structure, the writing sound, and this is one way you can really acquire written Tibetan. And if you, once you acquire written Tibetan, then you will have the whole world the language of education is really beautiful. And there are beautiful poetry written in Tibetan. When you translate it, it sort of captures it, but not completely. Now, there are verses that are written in Tibetan. And Tibetan writing language is monosyllabic. So every syllable has a dot. So it's a Tibetan language is a monosyllabic. And the, it lends beautifully to verse writing. And when you listen to the verse writing, there's a music in it. If you, if you ever noticed, if you ever thought of the Seven Dalai Lama song, you know, Shadow Revuten, Kezan Dawashan, Maje Ame Shele, Yila If you look at it, every single line has exactly the same rhythm. Shadow Revuten. Uh, so there's a beauty in this. And the same thing with many other verses. And once you start learning how to read, you will really then enjoy that music. And that music is never translatable in English. You know, you can translate it. In a game, you have done some translations of Seven Dalai's poems, which are beautiful. But it can never capture the full aesthetic experience of poetry. And these, but in order to get there, you have to do some hard work. And the hard work, language learning, is something that you build over time. So if you put in, like every week, you decide, I'm going to sit, spend one hour learning how to read. You do it every single week. It builds up. You know, in a year, you have 50 something hours. You build up. And then as you build up, it becomes exponential. Your ability gets better and better. And then you begin to enjoy. And once you start enjoying it, then you don't need motivation. The joy will get you there. Okay? So this is how language, this is how learning takes place. So I think there is a lot of ideas that came up and uh, I was really uh, uh, impressed. And, you know, 
some people spoke about the importance of compassion as a value. I think this is really crucial. Um, one of the things about, if you look at the old Tibetan text, uh, one of the very old idea is that the Tibetan people are, have a special connection with the Buddha of compassion, generosity. And Tibet particularly has a special relationship with Buddha of generosity, Buddha of compassion. And we refer to generosity as Hakel, our share of all, Hakel. And among all the gods, Avalokiteshvara is our share, Hakel. And then Haikalpa, our share. And then we see ourselves in Tibet as the generosity of the machine. And the generosity is, you know, kind of field to be tamed. So this is all part of this very important kind of you know, mythology and this idea that, you know, I showed you the photograph of uh, uh, the statue of um, Songzengapo. Songzengapo has a little Buddha head coming on the top of his head here. That is Amitabha. And that's an indication that he, is, he was viewed as Avalokiteshvara, Buddha of compassion. Because Avalokiteshvara has a little head of Amitabha on the top. So all of this is a very important part of the mythology which makes the point that among all the values, spiritual values, the most important one when it comes to Tibetan is compassion, Ninja. And Tibetan word itself, Ninja is the highest quality of heart. I mean it's like the king of heart, Ninja. I mean the Sanskrit is Karuna which doesn't have that connotation, you know, which has some kind of action connotation. The Tibetan, you know, the, the English word compassion, it comes from Latin, which suggests suff to suffer with, you know. Whereas the Tibetan word is very beautiful. It says Ningje, the king of heart, you know. <laughs> it's really, it really gives you that idea. So I think those suggest that, you know, not all of us may be compassionate, but every one of us tries to be compassionate. Okay? And, and if we take ourselves seriously as Tibetan, we have to at least make the effort with compassion. I, you know, I will take compassion seriously, and I will try to be compassionate. So those are really, really um, important uh, points that came up. And food, of course, is key. Um, momo, it's, you know, Momo and Fupa sort of came from outside, I suppose, but Momo really is Tibetan. <laughs> and uh, so those kind of, you know, food habit um, is, is also very important. So I think um, there's a really consensus and I'm, I'm really, I feel touched that this younger generation, first of all, I was expecting only around 50 people but the fact that it's more than double really makes me feel encouraged that Toronto Tibet you are taking this seriously and utilizing the resources that you have here well. And also the discussion really brought up a lot of points which suggest that it really matters to you. Because in the end, if it doesn't matter to you, you wouldn't be passionate about it. It has to matter. And you have chosen to take this seriously. Because otherwise, someone can say, okay, what the heck? I'm living in the West, I'm free. You know, I don't care. I don't need to carry that heavy responsibility of being Tibetan. Why should I care? You know, I just want to look after my family. Someone can do this. But you guys have said no. I choose to take this seriously. It matters to me. I want to do something. So this is really what makes this particular group Really wonderful. Thank you. Kabinche, Yerishi Nitsumbucho. Very, very grateful to have Geshe Dora Jinbala here to uh, conclude our uh, morning session uh, where there's enriching and enlightening practical guidelines on how to preserve and promote Tibetan language, culture, and history. I think it can get, it can get better than this. Um, our participants have a lot of materials to reflect on, 
and to carry with themselves. Moving on, uh, we have uh, our lunch break session for an hour. And uh, our lunch, I guess, is ready. Are we with lunch ready? Mm -hmm. We still have like 10 minutes, so I think we can take this opportunity to ask uh, if we have any questions from the audience uh, or the community members because uh, previously we couldn't give chance to the community members. So if our community members have, or we have a question there. So yeah, we can make use of this 10 minutes. Preservation of the language is really important for the latter, the second, because language is one area where we will be completely distinguished from any other modes of discourse. Tibetan language is only spoken by Tibetans or Tibetan cultural you know, area, such as you know, Ladakh or Bhutan or you know, some, for example, like large part of uh, Mongol regions in Russian Federation. They actually use Tibetan like a Latin in the West. You know, when it comes to chanting, when it comes to reading text, it's all in Tibetan. So, you know, Tibetan language is a primary medium through which the cultural discourse and the narrative is carried. So I think we need to make a distinction between what it means at the individual level and what is the best way to ensure long-term survival of the culture. So I don't think it's a contradictory. But on the individual level, I think you know your own identity. I mean, you are right. 
ethnicity is the first one. You know, we look different. You know, someone, you know, and people will say, oh, I'm from China. You know, I mean, I used to go to, you know, when the kids were small, we used to go to Cuba for winter vacation for a week or two. And on the beach, they were playing volleyball, and I would play, and they said, oh, come, the China man. And, you know, I always said, no. That's the worst insult you can give it to a Tibetan. You know, you can call me everything else, I won't get angry, but don't call me Chinese. <laughs> so, so that it, our ethnicity shows that we are different. And then it's a conversation starter. And so therefore, you know, race, ethnicity is probably in some ways more fundamental to the language. The language is the medium through which that is expressed. So I think it's not a question of either or. 